Mm-hmm. We're continuing the series of tshuva, repentance. Today it's number three. In case you miss number one and two, it's in my website, divineinformation.com. You can also find it at torahanytime.com. I think uh, every Jew, not I think, I know for sure, every Jew that wants to be close to Hashem must watch this series. Not because I made it, because I only follow the Rambam. Everyone who does it, it's fine. But this material that we read, it's come from the Rambam. That's the Alachah in Shulchan Aruch. This is how we're going to be judged in Shamaim when we die one day. This is how the judgment is. You know, you cannot say, ah, my opinion was like this. It doesn't care. Nobody cares over there how your opinion and what you think. It's what the Torah is, that's it. That's the halacha. It comes from the Gemara, mostly in Masechet Sanhedrin. The Rambam wrote it down. Then Rabbi Yosef Karo came. He wrote Shulchan Aruch. That's the halacha in Shulchan Aruch. That's how you judge. You understand? And that's, uh, and obviously, we want to know how Hashem is looking at us. So we have to understand. Uh, so if you know, the second shiur ended if a person made a sin, uh, he hurt his friend, he stole money from him, if, and he died, that friend. Or oh, he spoke Lashonara about him, and he died. Now there's nobody to ask for forgiveness. Where are you going to find him? He's in a grave. You have to bring ten kosher people to the grave, and ask, apologize in front of the grave, in front of the ten people, and that's it. If you owe him money, you have to pay his children. Those who inherit his money, whatever he wrote in his will, or if he did not write a will, his children got his house, they got his money, whatever, those are the ones you have to pay them back what you owe him. Because it's not enough to apologize to his grave, hey, I owe you a million dollars, but forgive me, here I brought ten people. No, you still have to pay. Okay, that's where we ended up last time. Uh, Today we are starting chapter 3 in Laws of Repentance by Rambam. But I have a quick question. Yeah? Ask the person is dead and you stole from them. How do you pay them back? He's dead. You just, I just said, you pay his children. You know, those who inherit him. These children. People got the inheritance. Okay. Yeah. Okay, now, everyone has merits and sins. Nobody is perfect. We know it. Everybody has good things and bad things. Someone who has more good things than bad things is considered a tzaddik. Someone who has more sins than mitzvot is considered a rasha. But it doesn't go numeric. It doesn't go, oh, you have two million mitzvot, one and a half million averot, automatically you're a tzaddik. Because you cannot compare one and one. It's depend the, the quality of the mitzvot and the quality of the sins. Which means sometimes one sin can be like a thousand other mitzvot. If you do, a, if you put a dollar in a tzedakah box a thousand times every day, one dollar, one dollar, it's a thousand different mitzvot of tzedakah. How much together? A thousand dollars. And then you made a sin with a girl. It's much worse than this thousand times that you put tzedakah, because this is sin arayot. This is mador shishi bagenom, almost the worst place in genom for all kinds of relation crimes, forbidden relation. So the one sin is like many, many mitzvot in a, in a scale. Sometimes it's the other way around. You made one Jew religious, and you made a lot of small sins, but this mitzvah of taking one Jew and making Shomer Shabbat, or bringing him to Yeshiva, and one day he becomes somebody who keeps Torah and mitzvot, this is a huge mitzvah, because you continue to earn from him forever, from him, from his children, so the one hour that you spoke to him and made him religious, or you gave him a CD, or you helped him when he was about to go to the street, and you helped him and you brought him back to the house, and now he, he, something good came out of him, that can be a huge mitzvah. So you cannot compare one mitzvah and one. It doesn't go by numbers. It go by the weight of each mitzvah. This mitzvah weighs two pounds. This mitzvah, a thousand pounds. This mitzvah, a million pounds. This sin can be ten million pounds. It's a big sin. For instance, you made one Shomer Shabbat, Chiloni. You made him not religious. You convinced him to come with you to the club. Slowly, slowly he became Chiloni, secular Jew. <laughs> this sin is uh, <laughs> it's very, very heavy. To correct such a thing, very difficult. Or you made a bad reputation to your friend. Nobody wants near him. Nobody wants to do business with him. Nobody wants to be his partner. Nobody buys in his store. This is not a regular sin. 
This is a sin that equals millions of sins. Because it's every hour, every minute. Another person, and another person, and another shiduch got ruined for his daughter. This is a very, very serious business here. It's a holocaust. It's not a joke. So that's why you have to understand when the Rambam says if you have more merit or more sins, he doesn't speak one in one. He speaks in equality. You have more, mitzvah, more good than bad, then you are tzaddik. More bad than good, then you are considered a rasha. Someone who has more good than bad, uh, we, we say is a tzaddik, but someone who has half and half, half and half, half good, half bad, 50-50. The truth is, the chance that a person will be exactly 50-50 is very, very small. Because you're talking trillions of mitzvot, trillions of averot, to be exactly the same number, eh, what's the chance? But the requirements of the Torah, that you always have to look at yourself as you are 50-50. It's not good to look at yourself and say, what a rasha I am, what a loser, I'm zero, I'm nothing, I'm the worst, everything I do is bad. Because if you think like this, you give up. It's like committing suicide. I say, hey, you know what? I'm, I'm a lost case already. Let me do whatever I want anyway. I'm a lost case. If you think you are a tzaddik, you'll never do tshuva. Mm, I'm perfect. You're telling me I'm not good? I'm perfect. I'm this. I'm, I'm 100%. Of course, you'll never become better. Because you already think you are Hashem. So you have to look, Rambam writes, that you always have 50-50. If you do one mitzvah now, you turn the scale to the good, you become a tzaddik. If you do one sin, you turn the scale to the negative side, you become a rasha. Now you come and tell me, okay, so now I just made a mitzvah, here I became a tzaddik. So now I'm a tzaddik. Now you have another test, to give tzedakah or not to give. If you give, it's another one to the positive side, but you say, I'm already a tzaddik, I don't need to give. I just did a minute ago. Wrong. Because after you did, you still have an obligation to look at yourself again now 50-50. You understand? Always 50-50. You just made a million mitzvot in a row. I'm still 50-50. Why? Because this is the way not to break yourself completely and not to think, ah, I'm okay, I'm okay. Some people think that when, if they die today, they go directly to heaven. Rabbi, I'm in the first row, in the VIP between the Babasali and Rav Kaduri. <laughs> they made me a chair on the stage. Why? I come once a week to hear one hour divrei Torah. Metzadik, no? My friend goes to the bar, and I come to listen to divrei Torah. Very nice. But if you're going to think like this, I come once or twice to hear divrei Torah, that's why I'm good. What's going to come out of you? When you be seven years old, you still am What do you know? There's a lot to know. The Torah is wider than the ocean. If you take, the world is 72% water. If you take all the water from all the rivers, all the oceans, everything, and you put it in your pen as ink, you won't finish to write new things from the Torah. One new things after the other without repeating yourself. And it's not an exaggeration. Think about it. How much water in the ocean? The, you continue to write and write. <clears throat> we have tens of thousands of books in Judaism. Tens of thousands of books. And each one has millions of words. Here, this is alone has more than a million words in it. And this is one out of six of the Rambam. And this is only one book. It's considered one. It says six. The Gemara has more than 20. Each one has, who knows, two, three million words. Think, calculate. You know how many books? Take all the books of all the religions and cults together, it's not even 1% of the books in Judaism. It's like comparing a monkey to a person. It's nothing to compare. It's comparing glass to a diamond. It looks sometimes a little bit the same from the outside, like the Muslim fake, all these sheikhs, qadis, whatever they call themselves, a mullah, I don't know, they have all kinds of names. I never understood the difference. But whatever they ever had... It's, not, it's like trying to compare a piece of garbage glass to compare to a real good precious diamond. From the outside, sometimes it may look the same. But every fool understands this is a billion dollar and this is a penny. Looks the same a little bit. They, they grow a beard. They also put something on the head. You know, they also speak by the microphone. It's, a, you know, it's, it's nothing to compare if you understand what, I'm, what I mean. Okay, now, if a person has more sins than mitzvot, 
if comes your Rosh Hashanah, which is the judgment day, so when Hashem signed on his, on his verdict, by the end of the 10 days is Yom Kippur, then he, for this situation now, he was sealed as a Rasha, wicked, right? If he was more mitzvot, then he was signed as a tzaddik. Okay, now, if he's considered a Rasha after the judgment day Yom Kippur, he's supposed to die. The Torah says, in Masechet Rosh Hashanah, this is what the Gemara says, Tzadikim nechtamim lealtar. If you are tzadik, Rosh Hashanah, right the way Hashem take your file and sign. The year, you know, this year, you are in a, in a green side, tzadik. Or in a red side, it's Rasha. And it's, and it's finished. Now what's happened now? He signed for you life, if you tzadik. He signed death, if you Rasha. Now you may ask me, why well, I don't understand. Here, Rosh Hashanah just finished. How many Jews are Mechalelei Shabbat? Close to 70-80% of the Jewish people. Drive on Shabbat, smoke on Shabbat, watch television. I don't see any one of them was signed to death. Maybe few here and there die. Or what about all the other business as usual, vacation, this, that, football on Shabbat. What's going on? Then I see a lot of tzaddikim got cancer and die from Rosh Hashanah to now. So many tragedies out there, a lot of religious people were signed to death. So that's against the Torah. The Torah didn't say that. The answer is, only an ignorant person may think that what the Torah said, that he signed for life or he signed for death, that means life in this world. Life in this world also the dogs get. The Indian in India that kissed the feet of Buddha every day also was signed for life in this world. The Egyptian murderer, or the Hezbollah, or the Palestinian, or Bin Laden, also is alive. What mitzvah he did besides murdering people? So you think that uh, when Hashem writes, uh, was signed for life, or was signed for dead on Rosh Hashanah, he's talking life here? Ma pitom, God forbid. The Torah means, if today he died, if today he was dying, what would I write in his file? Signed for life of eternity, has a share to the world to come, that's considered life, or he has no share to the world to come. That's what it means, life and death. Every time, I made a whole CD, audio, proving again and again and again that every time the Torah say the word life, it's talking life of eternity. Don't ever think that the Torah said that you should live, it means to live here 20 years and to die, like a dog. Most people suffer. Who needs this kind of life? Better not to be here. So that's not a price to live. It's only a price to live if you take advantage on your life. If you don't take advantage on your life, it's better to die right now. Why? To gain more sins? That one day I'm going to have to pay for them? Who wants this kind of life? I, I always pray to Hashem. I say, Hashem, listen, if I'm going to become a serious Baal Tshuva, and I'm going to become a big tzaddik one day. So far, I'm very far from it. Then keep me here. If I'm going to stay the same loser I am, take me now. Every day I ask Hashem, please take me now. So far, He didn't take me. But I'm telling Him, if you, if you know that I'm not going to improve, now take me. I don't want to be here another 10, 20 years. Who wants to? The overdraft is growing every moment. Better to die young. And I promise you one million percent. That every secular person or every religious person that makes more sins than mitzvot will curse the moment that they lived long life. They will curse it. They will come in front of Hashem. Their first complaint, they'll say they won't be able to complain about anything because everything they get, they deserve. Over there, everyone admit. But one thing for sure they would say, if that's the case, God... Why did you give me life in this world? Why didn't you take me when I was bar mitzvah? Do you think I liked my life? Do you think I love it? I'll give you an example. I have people who tell me, I don't want to be religious. Leave me alone. I know it's the truth. I admit, I have nothing to answer. You prove to me. I saw you DVD. Okay, it's the Torah. It's from God. No problem. But I'm not interested to keep it. When I die, I will deal with him. So I say to him, I don't understand. Are you a fool or are you pretending to be a fool? <laughs> he said, no, no, I have what to answer. You want to hear? I'll tell you what I say. And believe me, I didn't hear it once or twice. I heard it many times. When I'll die, 
as the Torah say, my trial will begin, right? The first thing I'm going to say in my trial, dear God, I love you, I respect you, I never told you to create me. You create me, it's your problem, I didn't ask for it. You cannot force me to pay for something I wasn't interested. You come to me, open your mouth, here, eat, eat the pork, and now pay me 20 bucks for the steak that I just fed you. <laughs> and you try to resist me, I give you a punch, I push it into your throat, 20 bucks, please. <laughs> you want to judge me for it? You crazy? What's going on here? So a person comes to Hashem, you created me. Did I tell you? Did I want to live here, Bichlal? You forced me to be here. I'm not interested in this kind of life. Don't want to keep Shabbat. Don't want to be honest. I want to be a thief. I want to make scenes with the girls. I want to speak Lashon Ara. I want to do whatever I want. This is what I want. You want me here. I want to be there. Uh, you cannot force me because I didn't ask you to make me, right? So the Magid Miduvna already knew 250 years ago there would be plenty of fools who talk like that. So he made a beautiful analogy, story about it. One blind person and his brother is deaf. Poor father, <laughs> one son blind, the other one deaf. They cannot find Shiduchim. One time a Shatchan came to their house and said, listen, I have two perfect girls, also sisters, for your two sons. What, but there's a problem. But don't worry, I'm going to take care of it. What's the problem? One of them is ugly like hell. <laughs> Mama, she can't imagine how ugly she is. But I'll set her up with your blind son, so you will never know. So that's a perfect match. The father said, oh, great, good idea. <laughs> so the other one is having such a dirty mouth, she doesn't stop cursing for a minute. <laughs> I'll put her with your deaf son. <laughs> perfect match. Everything else is fine. Her father has money, everything. He put them in, you know, in a good apartment, no problem. They made lechaim. The wedding took place. Now they live. A few years they live like this, happily married. One time a famous doctor came to town. Uh. The doctor came to town, he put an ad, I can fix every medical problem. Blind people, in one hour I turn them to see. Deaf people, I have a way to fix their problem. Right away people ran to them and say, come on, it's your opportunity. So they ran quickly to the doctor, one surgery here, one surgery there, he cured them. Now the blind person comes home, he opens the door, <laughs> see a woman over there, he fainted right away. She woke him up, hey Yitzchak, what happened, Yitzchak? Ah, he fainted again. Three, four times he got up, just from looking at her, he fainted. And then she said, wow, what are you doing in my house? She said, what do you mean, I'm your wife? Oh, now he got a heart attack already. <laughs> right away, he writes her a get, divorce, finished. That's, they cannot even look at her anymore. <laughs> then the other one comes home here from the window, curses. Where is he? I'll rip him apart. <laughs> She's cursing, throwing things. Wow, what a wild woman. <laughs> slowly, slowly, as he come closer to his apartment, <laughs> the noise become louder and louder. Oh no, oh no, oh no, I hope it's not mine. Oh, he opened the door. Where, where are you? <laughs> Boom, a shoe. You are my wife. My hair get finished. <laughs> now, both of them sit miserable for two, three days without their wives. And one of them say, you know what, whose fault it is? The doctor. Let's sue the doctor. <laughs> so they come to the doctor, they take him to court. So they just say to the doctor, listen, I know it's a foolish lawsuit, but at the same time they have a point. Before you came to town, they were very happily married. Now you came to town, look what happened. They all bought divorce, they bought the press. <laughs> they have some kind of a point, no? So I have an idea. I want you to take them tomorrow back into the hospital and reverse their situation to what it used to be. Oh my God. Make the blind blind, make the deaf deaf, and that's it, and you don't owe them anything. Just return them to the situation before you came. Fix the damage you made. Yeah. Right away, both of them started to scream. What? You want me to be blind again? Oh, you want me to be deaf? Forget it! What kind of judge you are? Why I'm telling you this story? Why I'm telling you this story? A person comes to Hashem and he's thinking, when I'll be 70, 80 and Hashem takes me to my trial, I'm going to say to him, it's your problem. I didn't tell you to put me here. I didn't want to be here. So Hashem will show him how when he almost died, he was sick, he didn't know if he has cancer or not. 
or you know, he has pain, he didn't know what it is, he was waiting for the, do- the doctor to give him the results, or Chas Shalom, he thought he got AIDS for three weeks, he couldn't eat, he was so nervous. So Hashem would show him, he said, oh, you didn't want to be here? If you didn't want to be here, why you lost 20 pounds until the doctor sent you your results? When they wanted to kill you, why you scream? No, no, don't kill me. Take everything. Don't shoot. Why? If, if you didn't want to be here, you would say, kill me right away. I don't want to be here. You jump in front of the train. But you fought for life because you wanted to be here. I, I made you a huge favor. Now you take the favor I did for you and you use it against me? You got it? What is it like? A person... A person lended money to his friend. Reuven gave money to Shimon. He gave him a lot of money. Two, three years, he doesn't pay back the loan. And in the meantime, he borrowed more money from more people. And now everyone come, bang on his door. Boom, boom, boom. Give us the money or we kill you. So he said to his friend Reuven, I'm in a big problem. They want to kill me already. I don't know how to pay them back the money. So he says to him, hey... I have a great idea for you. I learned it from David HaMelech. David HaMelech once pretended he's crazy. And he got saved from jail. Everyone who comes to you and asks for his money, start making faces, noises like a monkey, jump, you know, sing, scream, cry, laugh, you know, fall on the floor. After a few minutes talking to you and you go like this, "Eh, this is a chimpanzee, it's not a person. The money is gone. Then slowly, slowly they give up. Everybody in town will say that you became crazy, they'll have mercy on you, they'll leave you alone. So everyone, one after the other came, and this guy, ah, ooh, ah, oh, slowly, slowly, everyone left him alone. Then everyone left him alone, one time his friend came to him and said, what a great advice I gave you, he said, wow, beautiful. No, another month later, his friend comes and says, hey, Shimon, you owe me the money for two years already. Why are you planning to pay me? He started to go, ah, ah, ooh. He said, what are you fool? Who, who gave you this idea? You usually get against me. <laughs> you understand? I give you life. I give you everything. Now you, pre- you come, you say, I wasn't interested. You're using it against me. <laughs> Same thing, Hashem gave us a gift. What's the gift? It's called forgetness. There's a word like this in English, forgetness. Forgetting? Forgetting. Forgetfulness. 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 Ooh, that's the right word. Forgetfulness. So Hashem gave us forgetfulness. For... Forgetfulness. So, you know why He gave us forgetfulness? It seems to be a bad thing, not a good thing. Imagine if you wouldn't have it, somebody in your family, God forbid, died. You sit on the floor and cry for 70 years until the day you die, because you never recuperate. It always looks like it just happened. Why people slowly, slowly come out of the tragedy? Every day they forget a little more. Forget a little more until they go back to normal. So this is a cure. This is a recovery. So Hashem said to you, look, I gave you forgetfulness and you used it against me. You forgot my Torah, forgot my mitzvot, forgot this, forgot this. The gift that I gave you, you used it against me. This is what the Rambam talks about. So someone like this, in Rosh Hashanah, what it says, righteous people are signed for life. That means if they would die this year, in this situation like today in Rosh Hashanah, they go to life of eternity. If they would die today when they have more sins than mitzvot, I would sign them to eternal death, chas v'shalom. So that's what it means. The, oh, now the Gemara says, what about benoniim? Benoniim means mediocres. 50-50. He has a lot of mitzvot and a lot of sins. He has ten days to repent. Aseret yemet tshuva. If he's going to do a lot of mitzvot, the scale goes to the positive side. If he dies today, he goes to heaven. But if he wouldn't make tshuva, he died, he goes to chas v'shalom, to uh, eternal death. So, it's not only on the individual. Righteous or wicked, of course, is every person. Not only a person. Righteous or wicked is also in a country, a city, Tel Aviv. Righteous or wicked, the answer is wicked. Why? 95%, 98% not Shomer Shabbat. The beaches are full, all kinds of dirty clubs. All the people who hate Torah goes to live there. So if Chaz Shalom Hashem decide to take revenge now, this is one of the first places who will suffer. Bnei Brak, 98% Shomer Shabbat. 
more than 80% learn Torah daily. So much chesed, gmachim. So if you take the good and the bad in Bnei Brak, the scale has much more than, than the bad. The, the good side, why? Almost everyone religious. Yerushalayim, a lot of people learn Torah, full of yeshivot. So it's a religious, Las Vegas, very wicked place. San Francisco, very wicked place. Even though there's few righteous people that I know them personally there, but most of the people there are Shemirachem, what's going on out there, you understand? That's the way the world is. Every city has a status, righteous or wicked. And then the country. Rosh Hashanah comes, Hashem, look at this country, Egypt. Good or bad? And he decides, this is a wicked country, this is a bad country. Israel, wicked or righteous? America, wicked or righteous? And based on that, the decisions of that year is based on what you did up to now. And this is how the judgment works every Rosh Hashanah and is signed completely on Yom Kippur. Up to Yom Kippur you can appeal the verdict. If you are found guilty on Rosh Hashanah, you still have 10 days after Rosh Hashanah. Rosh Hashanah is two days, so you really have eight days after Rosh Hashanah, up to Yom Kippur to correct. But what you can do in these eight days, perhaps you cannot do in the entire year, because our special day, Hashem says, I'm very close to you. Take advantage that I'm very close to you. Dear Shu Hashem be your talk of. When Hashem is close to you. Let's move on. Up to Chanukah, Bedi Avad. Then, Kol Mishen Nicham Ala Mitzvot Sheasa. Every person who did mitzvot, and one day he say in his mouth, and he means it, I regret that I kept all these mitzvot. Ah, why was I religious all these years? Ah, I should have done what my friend did. He went to college. He was on a beach, he met this girl, he got married already, he stole millions of dollars, now he has a beautiful house, and me, I learned Torah, I kept mitzvot, what do I have today? I don't even, I can't even afford a car. And this is how he talks. What happened to him? Immediately he lose all his mitzvot. Think about it. What a loss. Worse than a holocaust. A person kept mitzvot so many years, and he say, I regret I wish I wouldn't do it. He lose everything in one second. Everything in one second. That's not a joke here. Nicham al mitzvot she'asav et al aschuyot. You wonder, ah, what did it pay for me? What did I get for this? What did Hashem give me? No, no, I'm religious 20 years. What did He give me? Where is the, the promises? All kinds of talking like this. A person jeopardizes everything. He can lose everything. I wish I wouldn't have done it. He lost everything with no exception. Everything. Think about it. Nothing of the good that he did will be remembered in his trial. Forty years he kept mitzvot. Forty years he learned Torah. He said, I wish I wouldn't do it. He lost everything in one minute. It's like building the Empire State Building. Forty years, one brick after the other. And then break, put a bomb in the bottom. In one second it's all collapsed. Forty years you build it, one minute everything collapsed. Someone, as I said, he was righteous, was signed for life, someone was not signed to death. Even though Rosh Hashanah has a mitzvah of shofar, you blow the shofar, and it is a decree from the Torah that we have to do it, that the shofar signified a wake-up call. An alarm, alarm, siren, wake up, fire! What are you sleeping? Uru yeshenim mishnatchem, unirdamim akitsu mitardematchem. Sleepers, get up, what are you sleeping? Get up, chapsu b'maasechem v'chizru b'tshuva. Search what you're doing wrong and correct it. וזכרו בו רחם, and don't forget Hashem, remember Hashem. Without remembering Hashem, how can you, you do tshuva? Those who forget the truth with the nonsense of time, this world, and may, er, they are mistaken in all their life in nonsense that will not get them any benefits, and they do, don't, do not care about their souls, and do not improve their evil ways, and do not leave their sins and the bad thoughts that they have, these are the people who have the biggest problem. 
Lefichach, therefore, a person has to see himself, like I said before, that is 50-50. Now I'm exactly 50-50, and I gotta turn it into the positive side. It means the next thing that I'm gonna do is a mitzvah. And then again, I'm 50-50. And the next thing, I'm gonna do another mitzvah. Oh, now I'm not 50-50. And a minute later, I'm again 50-50. Never to forget that I must do mitzvot every second of my life. Then, when a person's mitzvot are weighed on the scale, and the sin is on the other side of the scale, Hashem does not calculate the sins that He did in the first time of His life. First time of your life, you made a sin. And not the second time also. Twice, the first time you did that sin in your life, one time you're at pork, first time in your life, you're not judged for it. Then uh, two months later, again, you're also not judged. From the third one and on, you are judged for the third, the second, and the first. If you only did it twice, no, you're not guilty in your trial. Once and twice, not talking that you did it knowing, taking advantage on the halacha. Oh, I have up to two times to make a scene. No, that's a criminal. Talking, a person had a strong desire, he wanted to see what pork is, he ate. Then he feel bad, ah. Then two months later, again, the same desire he ate. That, those two times, for a person who is doing tshuva, he comes to his trial, those two times he's not taken into consideration in a trial. But if he repeated it for the third time, not only he judged for the third time, he also paid for the first and the second time. So the third one is critical. It's triple punishment. It's for the first and the second as well. If he sins, im nimtzeu avonotav mishlishi vaelach merubim al schuyotav. So when, Hash, when Hashem calculates, He takes all the sins you ever made in your life. He dropped the first and the second time, and He calculated from the third and on, from there on, all the sins that you did. אם נמצאו זכויותיו כנגד עוונותיו אשר מעוון שלישי ואילך מעבירים כל עוונות ראשון ראשון. לפי שהשלישי נחשב ראשון. The third one consider the first sin, which means it's contradict what I just told you. But of course you're busy with the food. You didn't pay attention that I contradicted myself in a second. I just told you that if you make the sin for the third time, you are judged for the first and the second. It's not true. No matter what, you judge from the third and on. What confused me is a very similar halacha. If a person has a bad thought to make a sin, but he did not do it, first, the, the actual thought that he went to do it, but he failed, he doesn't get punished for it. But if he, got, and he goes and he does it again, and second time he was successful, the police didn't come or something, and he did do it, now he pays also for the first one. That's bad thought. Machshava ra'a, en HaKadosh Baruch Hu metzarfa lemaaseh. Bad thought, HaKadosh Baruch Hu does not attach it to action. But second time, you fail, even if you did not do. You came to steal, and again the police came. Now you pay for the second time like you actually made the sin and also for the first time that you actually made the sin. Goim ba'acheret, huh? By goim is different, we're talking now for Jews. Okay, now. So, therefore remember, uh, when Hashem calculates on a scale, every sin you ever made, it's from the third and on. First and second is not on a scale. That's a discount. That's the mercy of Hashem. And then, based on that, you see if you're guilty or not, where the scale goes to. Okay, for instance, I give you an example. Let's see, there is a thousand different sins. And from each one of them, you did it twice. So it's right away two thousand sins. And let's see, you only did fifteen hundred mitzvot. Now you have two thousand sins and fifteen hundred mitzvot. So supposedly the 2,000 should be much worse, but the 2,000 do not count because it was the first and second on each one. If you would do the third, then you have th the third of 2,000 sins, then you would have a lot of sins. But since you only did first and second, it doesn't count. Then, then... Any sin? Huh? Any sin is like... Any kind of sins. Then, it says like this. Rambam now explain. Let's clarify it. Shh. So, third, fourth, fifth, each one count. What are we talking about? Be'yachid. 
and an individual, one individual Jew. שנאמר אין כל אלה יפעל אל פעמיים שלוש עם גבר. פעמיים שלוש from the third and on. אבל if it's a public, the entire city needs to be destroyed or to get saved. We don't know now how Hashem is going to find out, how he's going to find out the verdict of this city. On individual, it's the first and second are discounted, does not count. When it comes to the public, tolim laim avon rishon v'sheni v'shlishi. When it's the public, is what I said before. First and second is pending, no punishment. Once you do the third, it's chazaka, it's a certainty already. Now you get punished for the first and the second. So what is it like? One fool put an idol in the middle of a city. Everybody came and bowed down to that idol. Well, actually, idol is not a good example because Avodah Zarah is a separate category which we're going to speak about. Let's give another example. He put a not modest woman in the middle of town and everybody came to look at her body. Big scene. First time, it's pending. The next day again they came. The third day they came, now they pay for the first and the second. Clear? What about if a person alone came? Only one person. First time, not guilty. Second time, not guilty. Third time, guilty, but only for the third time. First and second doesn't get into the bill. You got it? Okay. Now, well, well, now it says like this. The righteous goyim. How you become a righteous goy? First, you have to keep the seven laws that Hashem told Noah after the flood 4,200 years ago. When the world had only eight members, Noah and his wife, their three sons and their three daughters, Hashem told Noah one mitzvah. Where did he get the other six? From Adam. There were six mitzvot before, he added ever minachai. Now it became seven. But since Hashem repeated it to Noah, we called it after the last event, not the first event. Why we don't call it the six laws of Adam and the one law of Noah? First, it makes it more complicated. Second, since Hashem repeated it to Noah, the last event is more substantial than the first one. For instance, uh, when we have the first destruction of the temple and the second, which one count bigger destruction for us? The second, because the first was rebuilt. If we wouldn't sin again, we wouldn't have it, and we would forget that we had one-time destruction, because we have the temple. If you got your car back from the insurance, you don't remember the tragedy that you lost it. But if the insurance didn't pay you, and now you don't have a car, every day you suffer, the, the last tragedy is in your mind. Same thing here. So, Hasideh Umat HaOlam, the seven laws that Hashem told Noah, you know what the seven laws are? You should believe in one God. You should not make any sex crimes with your seven relatives. Also, not, homosexuality and, and relation with animals is not allowed for the goyim. If a goy does those two sins, plus he goes with his mother, father, daughter, a, a son, grandmother, seven relatives that are around him, the closest relative, then it's a big sin for, for a goy. But if a goy has a girlfriend, it's not a sin for him. If they live together, if they move in together, they consider married automatically. Then if another goy cheat with his woman, even though she has a, a soulmate, that's considered eshet ish for the goyim. And it's a bigger sin. It, it, because by the Jews, it's a horrible sin to go with a married woman because it's an official married kiddushin. By the Goim, there's no official marriage. Even though they make marriages by the Arabs or by the Christians, it counts zero because it's not in the way of God. So therefore, it doesn't matter. They did it by the priest. They didn't do it. It doesn't matter. As soon as they moved in, that means she's my only one. And I'm her only one as two Goim, Chris and Christine. That means a married couple by the eyes of Hashem. If she cheat with another guy on her boyfriend, which consider her husband already, that's a bigger sin. It's one of the sins of the guy. It's a part of the Sheva Mitzvot Nenuach. The next thing, you should not steal. If a guy steal, he deserves execution, not like a Jew to pay double. So their punishment is very serious. 
then they should make themselves a court system and a system of police. They have to obey the rules that the people make, even though it's human laws. But since they nominate those people to make laws, like a Congress or this, then they have to follow their laws, the laws in town, the laws of the city, the laws of transportation. That's a part of their obligation. They should not kill any animal they should not eat any animals before they killed it completely, which means they ripped a part of the animal and eat it. Or even if they took a part, a, they ripped the leg of a chicken, like this. They ripped it without a knife, without anything, or even with a knife. They cut a piece, and they cook it, and they eat, without killing the animals first. That's called ever minachai. It's not permitted, not allowed. Then they, they should not worship any idols, they should not make any, any son of God or any statue or any image or anything. And uh, I think we covered the whole seven, no? Cover, if I forgot one, that's the idea. Seven laws, the Sheva Mitzvot Bnei Noach. Now, the, the, there's one other way that a guy can re elevate himself to a high level is by helping the Jews, loving them like in a holocaust, Many of the Europeans hid Jews, you know, even though it was only maybe 1% of the population that cared for the Jews, the rest cooperate with the Germans, either because they wanted the Jews killed or because they, they were afraid on their own life. Why do I care about the Jews? I'm going to risk my life for them? First, I care about my own life. Some of them called the Germans, here, there's a Jew hiding here. That's much worse. And some of them even risk their life to save their Jews. They hid them three, four years under their homes, and they gave them food. They were doing all kinds of things. And, or, or at least they saved the, the, the kids, and after the war they gave back the kids. To some, they look for a relative. They consider Hasidei Umot Olam, the righteous of the Gentiles. Today, there is other things that the Goim can do. For instance... The goyim are obligated to keep any law that is, is subject to common sense, even though it's not part of the seven laws. It's not in the seven laws. But for instance, uh, things that if a goy takes his garbage and throws it in the street, it's not a part of the seven laws, but it's common sense. Everybody understands that's not what God wants you to do. Right? Now the... The, 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 for instance, if a guy speaks Lashonara, right? He doesn't have it as a part of the seven laws. He doesn't have the seven laws, he should not uh, speak gossip or Lashonara. But it's a bad thing to do. A guy doesn't have an obligation to respect his parents. It's not a part of the seven laws. But a guy that does not respect his parents is a wicked guy. Ah, it's not a part of the thing, but it's mandatory. It's common sense. Even not religious Jews understand that this is the right thing to do. You go to a Jew that grew up in a kibbutz, he never heard of a Torah. And you tell him why you are bad to your parents, he understands he's guilty of something bad. Without knowing Hashem. I'm a bad person. Why? Because I'm hitting my father. I'm beating up my mother. I'm stealing their money. Whatever the case may be, I disrespect them. I curse them. I, they give me good and I use it against them. Everybody understands this is bad thing. So common sense are binding the goyim to keep it. I'll give you an example. The Gemara brings a person, a goy, that his father, they had a jewelry store. And a stone of Shevet Binyamin. There were 12 stones in the Hoshen of the Kohen. One stone disappeared, fell, and nobody found it. Now they needed to find that stone. So they went all over to look for the stone, and they came to that guy. His name was Dama Benetina. This Dama Benetina had the stone. He agreed on the price with them. He went up to get it, and he came back and he said, I can't sell you the stone. The rabbis didn't know why. They doubled the price 10 times, 20 times, 100 times. They keep raising the price. They must get the stone. He said, I cannot sell it to you today. The next day they came back to give him double. And he said, here is the stone for the first price I told you. First price. So they say, what do you, what's going on? We agree yesterday to give you the price. Why you didn't sell it yesterday? We raised the price a thousand times more and you didn't want to sell it. Now you tell us to give, you, to give only so, so, so little for it? So he said, yesterday my father was sleeping with his head on a box. I didn't want to wake him up. 
Yes, I didn't want to wake him up. So because of that, I couldn't sell it to you. Now my father is not here. Here, I can sell it to you. He's not obligated not to wake up his father. He was, he was able to wake up his father. There's no problem. Because it's not the seven laws. But because of that, Hashem made him a miracle. And a while after, he had a red cow that was born and he got billions for it. He became a very rich guy. Why Hashem gave him such a gift? Because he was willing to give up so much money for respecting his father. Right? Because of that, Hashem gave him a prize. So you see that the goyim that do good things, even they are not obligated, they can't lose. I have a few goyim that sends me donation to make Jews religious. They say, Rabbi, here is, here is my money. I want you to make as many Jews close to Hashem. Return his children back to him. Why are they doing it? They are very smart goyim. They know if the father lost his children and the children are on the street going to bad places and I will bring back to the king his prince. His prince is gone somewhere in a criminal city. I took the prince and brought it back to the king somewhere in Zimbabwe. I don't know where. <laughs> the king of Zimbabwe lost his son and I got the son and brought him back to his father. The king will be nice to me and give me a nice gift or will put me in jail. What do you think? Nice he will give me a nice gift. These goyim are very smart. They know if this guy makes so many Jews religious, let me be his partner. I make money. I give donations anyway. Let me do something positive with this. He takes the money. He gives free CDs. Another Jew became religious. It makes God happy. Thanks to me. So I show God I love him. I help him to get back his children. Right? Plus, I gave donation. Cannot go wrong. Very smart going. But how many like this you have? You can count them on one or two ends. Where are all the others? But it's not only by them. We, the Jews, that have an obligation to give, you know, by three dollars. <laughs> it takes 20 CDs, give me two dollars. 20 CDs cost me 20 dollars. He knows it. He's not a fool. He knows I paid for it more than two dollars. And he gives me $20. Now, if he's a poor guy, no problem. That's why we collect donations, to give it for free. But if he's a guy who drives a $70,000 Lexus, and he gives me $5, is he a tzaddik? That's the question he has to ask himself. He, 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 tomorrow he goes to buy another car for his wife, leather seat, put it in. Sunroof, put it in. A special stereo, put it in. Another $17,000. What? For what? For show off. Mitzvah? Two dollars. Three dollars. Yeah. You know, I was supposed to go to a place. The synagogue has hundreds of members over there, and it's a very wealthy synagogue. I asked them to give $1,500, which will go for the expenses of the trip, and a suitcase full of CDs. Not charging them for hours, for my time, nothing, all for free. Just that I come, it's worth it for me to leave hundreds of CDs as a follow-up to my efforts. If not, it's like filling up the water and spilling the water. What's the point? If you don't leave them two, three CDs, each one, to go and listen at home in a car and continue, no, how many ballet shoes are you going to do? Five, ten? You want to make a hundred, two hundred? That's a mandatory thing. Until now, three months, nobody agreed to give it. And this is all millionaires people from a very fancy community. And they all go express to Gehenom when they come in front of Hashem. So you didn't want to, you didn't want to, the people in the community, all the not Shomer Shabbos to become religious? Ah, but a fancy car, you wanted. A $10 million house, and another one, and another one, you wanted. But to save your brothers and sisters, and you call yourself a tzaddik, a righteous person? <laughs> what a joke. You don't care about my children and you want me to love you? Think about it. If you go and if you see this, the prince is drowning, and you walk by, and in one second you can save his life. How? Giving ten bucks to a guy that knows how to swim and he can save him. And you see him and you walk and you let him die. Can the king ever love you? After he see that you did such a thing to his son, we all guilty of this. All of us. Some of us more, some of us less. If you see so many not religious people around you and you can help them to become religious by inviting them to your house, 
by giving them CDs, by, giving, by inviting them to lectures, by making a weekly lecture in your house, and you do not do it, what do you show the king? Let your children die, what do I care? As long as I eat and my stomach is growing every day by an inch, I'm happy. Right? I can replace my Lexus every year or two, I'm happy. Uh, you know how they are, when the rabbi comes, as soon as a guy comes to collect, the shul right away becomes empty. <laughs> Why? Everyone is afraid that it's going to come to him. If the people don't have money and they're embarrassed, you know, they, to say no, they want to save the embarrassment, they're not guilty. But you and I know that some of them do have money. You understand? They do have money. They lose it in a casino, but they won't make anything to make other Jews become religious. You understand what's going on here? So this is goyim that are considered chasidei umot olam. Now, those are the ones, pay attention now, it was worth it for you to come just to hear this. Those are the ones who have no share to the world to come. When they die, their soul gets destroyed, and Hashem punish them for all the, the huge sins that they made. And all the intentional and the not intentional sins, and they are getting judged la'ad ule'olme olamim. Who understand Hebrew here? What does it mean la'ad ule'olme olamim? Forever and ever. That means a billion years is not the beginning of their punishment. Let's see if we are in this list before we jump from the window. At least we know the truth. Let's not dream that we are tzaddikim. I know some of us think we are the Rambam. Me and the Rambam are on the same chair, Rabbi. The same table in Olam Abba. I'm already in his yeshiva in Olam Abba. Let's see. You ready? If you're not brave, run now. Who are they? Aminim. Aminim. That's, I will explain in a minute what it means. Minims mean people that say, ah, there's, uh, there's other God. Uh, don't believe everything you hear. Apikorsim, people who change or modify the Torah. They said, well, you really believe this? You really believe this? You really believe uh, Moshe wrote the whole Torah? You really believe the whole Gemara is from Hashem? Come on, the rabbis added. They made, it, uh, they made it more than what is really required. You know, Hashem gave something, and they made it a lot harder. All kinds of things like this. HaKofrim Torah, they say Hashem never gave the Torah. No Hashem. I believe in Hashem, there's no God. Or they say, yeah, there is God, but He never gave the Torah. People made it up. Or they believe in the Torah, everything. But they don't believe in the resurrection of the dead. And Chiyatametim, don't believe this nonsense. Nobody can get up from his grave one day and walk. They forget that it happened already in history. With the prophet Ezekiel, Yechezkel, it happened already. One time, the tribe of Ephraim that escaped Egypt before Moshe Rabbeinu's time, they all died in the desert, and the prophet Yechezkel, Ezekiel, revived all of them, hundreds of them or thousands of them, got up, their ligaments and organs connected together, the soul returned back into the body, they got up, they looked around, and there was a huge noise in the valley, everybody looks at himself, and they all came back to life. We read it, I believe, in Yom Kippur. Chazon HaAtzamot HaEveshot, the vision of the dry bones. When did it happen? 2,500 years ago. 800 years after the exodus of Egypt. 800 years they were dead, the tribe of Ephraim, and the prophet Yechezkel brought them back to life after the bones were falling apart, completely dried. It's a part of the Tanakh, the Christians believe in it, and also the Muslims, and many different cults. But we have Jews that have the nerve and the chutzpah to come and say, ah, you believe this? A Jew can get up. You know, one Roman asked the Chachamim, Rabbis, you are intelligent people, you're very smart, there's no, and we're not denying that your Torah is brilliant, but how brilliant people like you say sometimes such foolish things? You really believe a person that his bones are dry in a grave, one day can connect together and get up like nothing happened? So the answer was, uh, a person that was made in the first place, 
How was he made from? From one drop of liquid, one drop of seed. For, take a little drop of water, throw it here. You believe a person can come out of it? Where the bones came from? Where the ice came from? Where the air came from this drop of water? Where? From where? What's bigger miracle? That from a drop a person will come out? That already half of his body are there. The bones, pieces. When half of it is already there. You, you see the skeleton. Oh, there is only a drop. Where is a bigger miracle? That the bones will become a person? Or the drop become a person? But the drop, nobody asks a question because they got used to it. But here, they're not used to it, so they're impressed. That's it. It's a, it's a much bigger miracle every person was born. But nobody appreciated it. <laughs> I give you an example. A wheat. You take one little seed, you put it in the ground, beautiful thing comes out. Where it come from? Orange tree. One seed from the orange. You saw the seeds? So how they look? You ever believe from something like this a tree can come out? How can it be? You see, it happens. Why are we not impressed? Because we, we grew up with this. Since we're crawling on a rug, this is the way we were taught. Ah, but that's something like this we never saw. We see rain every day, every week here in New York. We are impressed from the rain? No, we got used to it. You know what a miracle it is to have rain on all, all area, to give water to all the, the, the plants, the trees? You know what a miracle? But we got used to it. What happens if a pink rain will fall? We will hide under the rock for a week. <laughs> Nobody will go on the street. You will never find one person who walks with an umbrella unless if he's crazy. What happens second time pink rain come? 20% of the people got brave and they walk on the street already. Business. Time is money, Rabbi. Last week there was pink rain, nothing happened. No, we take the risk. Third time, 50% of the people go out. Four time, 80%. Fifth time, 95%. Six, seven times, everyone walks. Imagine the Prime Minister of Israel after four years in coma. Remember now to open his eyes. He opened up his eyes, he looks from the window, he see everything pink on the glass, people walking in umbrella, smoking cigarettes, walking in the street. You know, I, I came to the wrong world. <laughs> it's not the world I was here. He is impressed. And everybody else walking in the rain, I'm singing in the rain. <laughs> what happened? They just got used to it. The, the difference between a miracle and nature, it's the frequency. That's it. The more frequent it is, the, the less impressed we are. The less frequent it is, the more we impressed we are. That's it. So before we finishing, so people who say no resurrection of the dead, people say you believe Mashiach will come. Why you believe in all these things? You really believe one day is going to be the Messiah, he's going to save the world, he's going to make order here, all the wicked people will die, all the righteous people will come back to the world, like these Jews are saying. Come on! Someone will say, don't believe in it. I believe in everything. Mashiach, I don't believe. I know a lot of people with beard that talks like this. You know, people who rebel against Hashem, they do on purpose to get him angry. They have pork and glad kosher beef. The beef is hot. The pork is cold. What's tastier? The beef. They eat the pork. Why? To get the rabbis angry. That's so dafka. Yes. Or people who convince other Jews to be wicked like them. Come, come. Come on Shabbat to the football. Come. Don't worry. Come on. Don't be fanatic. Come. It's not the end of the world. I'll drive. Don't worry. Come, come with me to the disco. You want to get married, no? Where are you going to find a girl? You and your yamaka. Come with me, come. Slowly, slowly, he made him a goy. That's it, he doesn't keep anything. That's called Machtie Arabim. DJ in parties, in disco, in weddings, mixed dancing. People like this, that's it. They destroyed for eternity because they are making hundreds or thousands of people making scenes. People who make website against the Torah to convince Jews not to become religious. Especially when they're all liars and, and cheap manipulators that take advantage on the ignorance of the public. Bring them to me. Let's see if they try to sell me their nonsense. 
Right away they run away. Once or twice I attack them, right away they disappear, you don't get any answer from them. But the people who don't know anything, it's very easy to fool them. Mm-hmm. Uh, the rabbi told you this, I give you an example. When I speak in my video, Torah and Science, about the fish and the scales, the fins and the scales, I said in my video, everybody can go and check me out, I say, the Torah promise, the oral Torah, the Gemara, the, prom- the Gemara promise, everything that has uh, f- uh, uh, scales, for sure have fins. And I said, the Torah said, this is what you're going to eat from all the water. Which water? Did not specify. Everywhere. 72% of the world. What does it mean? This. It doesn't say name. Everything. Everything that has fins and scales, you have to, you're allowed to eat. That's what the written Torah say. You go to the oral Torah, the oral Torah say you should know. There is a rule in nature. Everything in the water that has Scales for sure have fins. Come this liar, who you can see his clips on YouTube. He takes my video and he say, you believe him? It's nonsense. What does he show? Some kind of a snake that has uh, scales on his skin. First of all, we are talking about things that live in the water, not things a crocodile or an animal that lives in a jungle. I was saying clearly, we are talking about p- things that live in the water, all the time inside the water. If they have scales that you can scratch it, as Rashi writes, and they're falling off, then you sh- guarantee to have fins in the body. But this fool, all he does is changing one or two words of what I said. And now he brings an animal, which I don't even know where he got it from, an animal that walks on four from some sea. See, this animal has it, but doesn't have fins. You see, it's nonsense. You know how many fools will believe this idiot? Many. But this is what they do. So people like this have the worst hell when they die. The worst. And you know what? Sometimes I'm happy they're doing it. Even going? Knowing, even going, because the going have no permission to contradict the Torah. So sometimes I, I have other Jews that get very upset. I tell him, you know, yes, you're right. There's, in one point of view, there's a, there's a reason to be upset, because they're affecting very... Many ignorant Jews not to be religious. But on the other hand, when I know how much sins they do, I'm happy. When I'm going to get to see their hell, that's going to be the best feeling, <laughs> that they get what they deserve. That's it. <laughs> David HaMelech writes in Tehillim, Mesanecha Hashem Esna. I don't hate anyone unless if he hates you, Hashem. Those who hate you are my enemies. I hate them. Why? Because I love you. If I love those who go against you, that means I hate you. There's no... You cannot love the haters of Hashem and love Hashem at the same time. It doesn't work that way. If you love the enemy of your father, you hate your father. If you hate the enemy of your father, that's a sign you love your father. You cannot be a person who wants to kill your father and you love him just as you love your father. Cannot be. Ah, you love him? That's a sign you have something ah, against your father. If you enjoy your father like uh, hate Hashem, that's it. You in Tshuva, you love Hashem, and your cousin hates Hashem. Your cousin hates Hashem, he's going to go into this category. First of all, not everyone who says hates Hashem really hates Hashem. 99% of what the people tell me in the lecture, it's lies. Today, I know it even better than before. Because 12 years ago, I didn't learn body language, sign language. I didn't learn. Today I know it very well. So if a person argue with me, I hear what he say, but I look at his body. The things that he does with his hand, with his nose, with his mouth, with the way he moves his shoulders, his, head, his knees, his hands, how he goes forward, how he jumps to the edge of the chair, every movement shows what goes through his, his mind. Sometimes he tells you, ah, he didn't convince me, and his body shows I'm 100% in. But I won't show it in front of my friends because 20 years I spoke against the Torah. What, in 15 minutes I'm going to show them that you convince me? That means I'm nothing. I have to continue with my show. But his body already showed that he's convinced, you understand? And I promise you it's almost always like this. They talk and make a lot of noise. And when they have the, the boy sick, they run to the rabbi. Rabbi, help me out. Give us bracha. <laughs> 20 years you speak against the rabbis and the Torah. Ah, now you run to the rabbi? Of course, because they never meant what they say. 
They're just foolish people that have no brain. They talk and talk and talk, thinking talk is cheap. We say in Hebrew, Alashon en la etzem, the tongue doesn't have a bone. You can do whatever you want with that. Mm-hmm. No limitation. They do not know that you pay for every word, every beep you ever made against the Torah or Hashem or the rabbis, there will be a very, very painful and heavy price. Why? Because Hashem said so. You don't believe that Hashem said so? Come, I'll prove you that the Torah was written by Hashem. That's it. End of argument. All I have to do is to prove that it's divine. I prove it's divine. A person couldn't write that book. Everything in this book is true. Nobody can argue. The Torah said that these people I'm reading to you are the ones who will get the worst hell. How do I know? I didn't see. I didn't, Hashem didn't take me on a tour to hell to see the seven different places. He wrote to me in a book that that's what's going to happen to these people, and I know 100% it's going to happen. I know, you know how I know? Because Hashem is not a liar. You know how I know it's not a liar? First of all, it's common sense. Second, it says in the Torah, I'm the strict, righteous God that will not move an inch from the truth. I'm the God of the truth. I'm the God of the justice. I'm paying everyone what he deserves. I'm the greatest judge, etc., etc. All of a sudden, it's going to be all lie. Why? Is a member in a Congress? Mm-hmm. What is he? Okay, time is running out, so let me just finish it. It says here like this. There are other people who have no share to the world to come. People who turn Jews into the hand of the goyim. Police! There's a Jew here, come get him. <laughs> we are not talking that he's risking your life. If, if you're not going to call the police, you'll be dead. By then, you're allowed to call. Or if he constantly breaks into people's houses, you're allowed to ask for the help of the police. But if you see, he didn't pay his full taxes. Yes, he's a criminal according to the law of the United States. But you don't have permission to turn him into the goyim because they're going to give him 10 years in prison and that's not what God wants. He wants him to get a punishment for it. But nothing compared to what they give him. You understand? So by turning a Jew into the authorities, the judgment of the authorities is against the Torah. It's not the wish of God. God doesn't want a person that uh, somebody told him, buy that stock, it will go up tomorrow. Buy it. I know my father worked in a company. Buy it. You went and bought a lot of it. Two days later, the FBI come, they put handcuffs on you, take away your home, take away all your money, destroy your children's life, put you six years in prison, you pay $300,000 for a lawyer because you made $20,000 on a, a tip that your friend gave you. That's not the punishment that Hashem wants a person to get. You turn him into the authorities, you destroy this whole family. That's why you have no share to the world to come. That's why a Jew can never work for the IRS. Why? You're serving a law that is against your God. God doesn't want Jews to pay this. He doesn't want them to sit 10 years in prison. So all these modern orthodox fakers that work for the FBI and for the... And, and some of them even judges in a court with Kippa Ktana, size of a quarter in Israel, like the one who sent Igal Amir to prison. He had a, a Kippa. Or the one in a, in a Knesset, another Burg, Rasha, Merusha, that says that the religion is Iran. He has a yamaka and speak against the rabbis in a Knesset. These are the people that they are in a war situation. Why? You coming to show me you my lover and you stab me in the back? Of course you're much worse than a person who shows me he's my hater. He shows me. Stay away from me. I can't stand you. You come and up, you turn around and... Come on. Uh, that's too much already. Five people, or oh, one other person is a murderer. A person who murder on, on purpose. If he doesn't make tshuva, all these things that I say, it's only if we did not make tshuva for it. If we make tshuva and one day we stop, we regret, as I said in the first session, in the first year, go to the number one and number two, then we corrected it already, that's it. If we used to not believe in Mashiach, we used to speak against the Torah. We used to say things like this, but not anymore, and we're ashamed of it, and we regret it, etc., etc. Therefore, we are okay. We made tshuva. If we murdered someone, or ten, or a hundred, or a thousand, and we made tshuva, we do have a share to the world to come. We still have to pay for all the things we did, but it gives us a share to the world to come. We are talking now people who died without tshuva. Murderer. There is no share to the world to come. Someone who speaks Lashonara. 
Lashon Hara. I give you, today it's very common today. Today, there's a lot of politics that got into religion. Let's say you open a restaurant, and you, you have a shochet that slaughtered the cows and the sheep. And he's a perfect shochet. He's many years shochet, he knows all the halachot, everything. You have to get an ashgacha, a supervision, from one, there's different names. It's business. You gotta pay the money. Let's say one day you want to leave them and go to another Ashgacha. They put in a newspaper and they send email that your meat is not kosher. And it's a complete lie. Why? Just because you left them and you went to somebody else to supervise you doesn't mean you're not kosher. You just don't want to use them anymore because it's a rip-off. You went to somebody else to watch you, but they don't care. They write to everyone, this restaurant is not kosher. Well, how do you know? It's a lie. He got somebody else to do it. He has the same shochet. For you, he was good. Now when he stopped paying you, he's not kosher. You put him out of business. You have no share to the world to come. It's not a joke here to speak Lashonara about an innocent person. It's a big thing. And one day if you want to fix it, you got to pay him all the money he lost. That's why nobody makes tshuva on Lashonara. Lashonara that didn't cause money lost, it's not as difficult to correct. You apologize, you never do it again, the person forgive you, and it's over. But if you made a person lose a million dollars now, you went on television and said that restaurant, uh, they, they sell uh, donkey meat. It's a lie. They say it on television. The next day, they're out of business. Nobody comes in. It was all a lie. One day you come to the owner of that restaurant, I want to apologize. Forgive me, please. For what they did. Forgive me, forgive me, but you caused me five million dollar damage. You must pay it. You don't have, you will come back in another life and be a slave. You understand? For 70 years. That's what's going to happen to you. That's why you got to be very careful what you say. Don't ever talk against people. It's better to make your mouth, yeah, like they say in kindergarten, lock the mouth and throw the key into the ocean. <laughs> I know a person, no matter what you're going to do to get him to speak something rational about someone, solid like a rock. I'll never say a word, no matter what. Even he has a lot to say. A rule. I don't talk against any person. Nothing. No matter what he did to me, I don't talk. That's a very high level. Somebody like this doesn't hurt himself. Say two, three Lashonara about a person. Go and find all the people. Remember the lecture I made here? Email from Hashem? Mm-hmm. You know how many people send me emails when I know that they were sending me this email, they were crying after they watched that lecture? Because they know it applies to them. All of us. Who doesn't speak Lashonara today? Almost everyone. So, so this is his no share to the world to come. And a Moshech Or What does it mean, Moshech Or You're not going to believe this. Probably never heard that before. In the old days, it used to be public showers. Not like today, everyone has his own suite. In the old days, Jews go in, they go into the public shower, they go into the baths, and, and they take shower. Now, when the people naked, they go in, they are not circumcised. Today, almost everyone is circumcised. But 2,000 years ago, nobody was circumcised, only the Jews. The Jews, some of them were embarrassed to show that they're circumcised. So they used to push, to pull, and pull, and pull. After a while, it shows that they wasn't circumcised. It's like if you take your ear and constantly pull it, pull it, pull it, pull it, one day it's going to be longer. So that's what they used to do to show that they're near. I'm not Jewish, I'm like you. You can do business with me. We can marry our children or for any kinds of reasons. Someone like this is no sure to the world to come that he's embarrassed, that he's circumcised, as Hashem said. Five people are considered to be minim. Remember what I say, a minim, they have no share to the world to come. Someone who say there is more than one God, God forbid, like the Greeks and other people, it has to be more than one God. The God of the Jews, the God of the Goim. The, God, the good God, the bad God, all this nonsense that people talk. Someone who say there is one God, but he has an image. He has a nose, he has eyes, he has hands, he has a shape. Is yellow, is green, is red, is black. Chas he v'shalom. He gives him an image of uh, something material. It's, yeah, and it's right away becoming an idol worshiper. That he thinks that this is the image of God. 
Someone who say, yeah, there is God, but it wasn't the first God. There was a God before him who made him and left, or died, or something like this. Or someone who bowed down to any idol, or, or signs, I believe in the horoscope. That's what brings me Parnassah. I'm going to check and see what's going to be with me. Or someone who say, you need a rabbi to connect between you and Hashem. Like many of the breast levers in Chabad in our generation, they say if you want to connect to Hashem, you have to believe that this rabbi is his messenger and he's the Messiah. He never died, and this is who you have to believe in. Or if you don't believe in Rabbi Nachman mi Breslev, you cannot connect to Hashem. And there are thousands of fools who speak like this. They have no share to the world to come, even if they keep Shabbat, even if they give tzedakah, even if they're not stealing, even if they watch their mouth, even if they're not making any sex crime, they come to the synagogue three times a day, Hashem will pay them and their children in this world, but they cannot enter the next world because they believe God has a broker. You have to connect to the bank through this broker. You cannot go directly to the bank, they say to you. You have to connect through me. Beloni, what do I need you for? I go directly to the bank. What I need you to be my broker? I'll tell you, tell the bank I want a loan. I can tell them myself that I want a loan. I can speak to Hashem and tell him, Hashem, help me. What I need to go to him, that he's going to bring my prey to Hashem? This is called Christianity 100%. And don't be impressed from their big, nice, beautiful beards and their black hats. And they, 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 very, they watch their eyes. It's beautiful. Every mitzvah they do, they'll get paid for it. But if they say, you cannot connect to Hashem unless if you connect through Rabbi Nachman mi Breslev, this is what the Rambam talks about. The Ramban, which live almost about 100 years after Rambam, he said there will be rabbis that will go to hell and never ever come out of there for eternity. Even if they teach all their community to keep Torah and mitzvot, they will go to hell and never come out of there. What, how can it be? <laughs> they teach his community 40 years Torah and mitzvot, and in the end he has no share to the world to come? The answer is yes. Because he saw that his foolish community worshipping him and are afraid from what he thinks. And when they, when they need something, they go to him. And when they don't have Parnassah, they think he's the one who brings me my Parnassah. And they felt great about it. Look, I'm the, I'm the God here. Everyone bow down to me. I walk into the shul, shh, silence. But when they pray in front of Hashem, talking. Where, where is Hashem? Ah, the Rebbe is here, we have to be quiet. Come on. You know, it reminds me of a good joke. One uh, Rebbe passed away, and he left only one little kid, one year old, one year old, in his crib. So all the Hasidim, they make tish on Friday night. 2,000 Hasidim came to see who is going to be the new Rebbe. So they see a one year old baby is crying in bed. So one Hasid tell his friend, the new Rebbe is seeing things in the upper worlds, that's why he's crying. So his friend told him, until, he's, until you talk about the upper world, why don't you check his in Tachtonim? Al Chata Bodek why don't you check in his Tachtonim? <laughs> right away, the little kid did like this, oh, that's a sign that this and this is going to happen. He did like this, oh, that's a sign that something good has happened. Come on, with this nonsense. <laughs> All this nonsense came from one place, Christianity. Whatever we heard over the years from them, somehow penetrates to Judaism. Don't ever let these people fool you. Don't give them a penny for their books, for their tapes, for their CD, nothing. And don't be impressed that they're very righteous people otherwise, that they do a lot of great things. Doesn't matter. They made God a partner, and it's the worst sin you can think of. You're never allowed to say that God has a son. God needs a messenger. The only time that we had a messenger was in the time of Moshe Rabbeinu, and Hashem made sure that his grave will be unknown to anyone. Why? He knew if Rebbe is in our time, we made the grave holy. Imagine Moshe Rabbeinu if the world would know where he's buried. Nobody will remember Hashem Bechlal. Moshe would become the God. Because it's something that we saw. He opened the ocean. He brought water from the rock. He did this, he did that. He's our God. Like today, there's a lot of people who believe in people. What do you think? 
That's why, if, even if you one day Bezrat Hashem become Chachamim and become a Rabbi, don't ever let the Satan fool you. It's very, very strong evil inclination that you become a big man to become a big shot. Always be down to earth and always tell your followers, it's not me, I'm nothing, I'm only going to beg Hashem for you, but you have to talk to Hashem, your, everything comes from God, nothing from me, I can only teach you Torah, nothing else. Even my blessing, sometimes it may help, most of the time it won't help. Don't count on me, count on him. If you make him think, you see, I gave you a blessing, I saved you. Why don't you send me donation? <laughs> it's very common today. <laughs> what is this? You have to send me donation because I do the right thing according to the Torah, not because I made hocus pocus and walk on waters. For that you don't have to send me donation, you have to send me to jail for making magics and fooling people. For, for jail, that's where you have to go. Not to, uh, oh, you know, I like this rabbi, because he did this and this and that, as a hocus pocus. Uh, Rambam say, when a prophet comes, you're not allowed to tell him, how do we know you're a real prophet? Make us some, some magics, and we believe in you. You're not allowed to tell him. Even if he does any magic you can think of, he makes the water go against gravity. He makes the building tilted like this. The building is in the air. It's not, it's not an indication that he's a real prophet. It's not an indication. How do, you know? How do you know? You tell him, tell us your prophecy. And when the time comes, we'll see if you're right or wrong. If it's a bad prophecy, if it's a good prophecy, we wait for the date that he said. If it happens, he's a real prophet. And he's going to be memorized in history as a holy prophet. If it did not happen, the good thing, then he's a false prophet who must be killed. Don't let him live. If he say a bad prophecy, bad prophecy, it's not an indication that he's a false prophet. If he say next month on this day, this city will be destroyed. We can still make tshuva. Why Hashem wants to destroy the city? He wants us to start keeping Shabbos, to stop making crimes, to return all the stolen goods. Everybody improved himself, the place became holy, Hashem cancelled the decree. Like Yonah and Nineveh. Hashem sent Yonah to Nineveh. He said in 40 days the place will be a mess, destroyed. They all, the Goyim made the tshuva, repentance. Hashem cancelled the, the punishment. Two years later they went making sin, make sins again, and then Hashem punished them and destroyed them. But at that time... The tshuva that they did, uh, and, the, and the Torah says, Hashem saw their actions that they were changed from bad to good. Not only their prayers, their actions. To pray, it's important. If you pray, 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 and you stay in the same corrupted person, don't expect a miracle. You have to stop stealing. You have to stop cursing. You have to learn Torah. You have to do everything better. With the prayer together, it helps. Somebody who believe in the stars, the moon, the stars, Ovet Kochavim, it's also an idol. Any one of those are considered minim. Three people are falling in a category of apikorsim. Apikors. Someone who say, there is no prophets. Nobody knows the future, don't believe in it. There is no prophets. Wow. Somebody says, There is no direct connection between the Creator to people. He, left, he created the world and left it. That's it. He's not watching us anymore. From now it's all coincidence, God forbid. Someone who say the prophecy of Moshe Rabbeinu is incorrect. Cannot rely on it. Or Moshe wrote almost all the Torah, but some of it he had from his own opinion. Something like this, God forbid. It's a very critical crime. It's not a joke. Someone who said the Creator does not know the future or what the people will do. He doesn't have control on the future. He doesn't know. Whatever we're going to do, we surprise him. God forbid. Any one of these three categories, it's called apikorsim. Three are considered kofrim batorah. How do you say kofer? Uh, infidel, infidels? No, no. Inf infidels. Infidels? What's the right word for that? Infidels, yes. Infidels is kofrim. Someone 
someone who say, there's one word in the Torah, it's not from Hashem. Everything is from Hashem, the rest other people wrote. Someone who says that the written Torah is real, but the oral Torah, I'm not so sure. Ah, Rabbi, the Mishnah, the Gemara, I'm not so sure. The written Torah, of course, of course, like the Karaim, like the Shomronim, like the, the, the whatever, you know, all their names, whatever they call, the Karaites, you know. It's, so it's, it reminds me about a beautiful story. In the time of the Gaon Nivilna, the head of the Karaites that don't believe in the oral Torah, they only follow the written law, but it's also Beloni, because everything they do is based on the oral law. How do they know how to make tzitzit? It's not in a written Torah. How did they know how to make tefillin? It's not in a written Torah. How did they know how to slaughter an animal? It's not... A, almost everything they do, they learn from the oral law, and in the end they say, we don't believe in the oral law. Doesn't make sense. But uh, the Karite wants to make a debate with the chief Orthodox rabbi. So they went to the Gaon Mivilna. The Gaon Mivilna didn't want to waste his time, so he sent one of the rabbis. So you are good, you're going to finish him up. So he went to the king. There was a king in those days. Dictators, like today, in the Arab country, soon, Be'ezrat Hashem, there won't be any left. But this was a king. So the Orthodox rabbi and the Karaites are standing in front of the king. So when they come to enter his office, and the king has to hear both sides, who's more right, the Orthodox, so they, they see that everybody takes their shoes off. The advisor of the king, they all put their shoes out, and they come into his palace, without the shoes. So the Karaites took his shoes and he put it outside. The Orthodox rabbi took his shoes off and he was holding it in his hand. And he walked inside next to the king's desk and he's holding his shoes. So the Karaites wanted to make the king hate him. The Karaites said, listen, your majesty, please pay attention to this Chatsuf rabbi. He doesn't trust you and your advisor to leave his lousy shoes outside. How much is shoes worth? He take his shoes with him like we are going to steal his shoes. Can you believe this kind of orthodox Jews? So the king look at him. The king is surprised. Never saw a face. A person come with his shoes in front of the king. The king got a little angry. The king said, what do you have to answer? So he said to the, to the king, your majesty, there's a very, very serious reason why I carry these shoes with me. Many years ago, when Moshe Rabbeinu, our prophet Moshe, Moses, God came to him from a burning bush, furnace, and he told him, Dear Moshe, take your shoes off your legs, off your feet, because the place that you're standing is holy. And Moshe took his shoes off, and he went towards the bush, and later, when, after God spoke to him, when he came back, the Karite stole his shoes. And Moshe had to walk for days without shoes in the thorns and on the rocks because the Karaites stole his shoes. So I'm afraid he's going to steal my shoes. That's why I'm holding it. Not because of you and your advisor. I know you have no interest in my shoes. So the Karaites went crazy. <laughs> you liar! You see what a liar? I prove to you that he's a liar. The first Karaites rabbi was only a thousand years ago, Rabbi Anan. There was no Karaites before. How does he claim that the Karaites stole from Moshe Rabbeinu his shoes? His shoes? So the Orthodox rabbi told the king, Your Majesty, did you just hear this fool? <laughs> his, his ear should listen to his stupid mouth. He just admitted that they only started 800 years ago. The Gaon Mivina was 250 years ago when this story happened. So the Karaites was a thousand years ago from today. So that means 750 years ago. They only exist 750 years ago, and we are existing 3,100 years. And they come to say that we are, the, we are not the original? <laughs> the king said, the argument is dismissed. Get out of my face. Send the car right away. Hashem <laughs> Yerachem. I, I, oh, I have five more minutes to finish. Pay with me. Sure. Bear with me. Okay, now. So, shh. Okay, now. Someone who says, the Bore replaced the Torah. There was one Torah, and one day he changed it. Or, this mitzvah is not relevant anymore to our generation. It does not exist anymore. 
this used to be this mitzvah. Today it's not important anymore, so you don't have to keep. How many of us, how many of us, you know, how many of us are saying these things without paying attention? Ah, this is not important anymore. It used to be. Or, or someone who say, like the priest that spoke to me, it says, the Torah covenant applied up to a certain generation. From now on, it's cancelled. This Torah is not, uh, is not applying anymore. It doesn't apply anymore. So somebody like this is falling into this category of call, it's called Kofer Batorah, the infidels. And who are considered to be Mumar? Mumar is a person who was transferred from Judaism to other religions. That's what we call today Mumar. Replaced his original religion. Now, every Goy is allowed to convert into Judaism. is a big mitzvah for him. A Jew can never convert to any other religion. There is no free choice about becoming a Goy. Why? Imagine if your father is the king and you are the prince. Now you want to become a shoe shine in Manhattan. You stand in a booth and shine people's shoes. And you're representing the king. You have permission from your father to go and shoe shine? <laughs> father, I don't want to be a billionaire prince wearing gold clothes. I want to wear garbage clothes and shoe shine for two dollars a day. That's what I want to do. Your father say, if you were just another person, I will let you do whatever make you happy. But you representing me, you have no permission to become shoe shine. You are a prince. A Jew that was born the son of God wants to be... A, a diamond wants to become a glass? Come on. Mm -hmm. Where is your head? That's why there's no permission. Then, then it says like this. Oh, who are the Mumar? Someone who knows the Torah and he keeps mitzvot, but one mitzvah he doesn't care, like shaving with razor. Ah, no, that's not for me. I can't do it. So come on, it's a, it's a big thing. You keep doing it every day. You're not allowed. He says, no, no, no. I keep everything. This leave me alone. I like to do it. Or, one, I only eat shrimps. Everything else I eat kosher. But shrimps, I can't give it up. <laughs> I want to eat it every day. If he make a scene once in a while, it's common sense. It's normal. This is the way the world is. But Bishita, in a system, eh, I don't care about this. Don't tell me what to do. I like to do it that way. Knowing it's wrong, for me it's fine. That's called Mumar. Somebody like this is a very serious problem. For instance, wearing shatnez. He's wearing wool clothes, and he doesn't check it before if it has linen. If it has linen mixed with wool, every second that he wears this jacket is a big sin from the Torah. Shatnes, tzemer vepishtan. Im zemeorav. If you look at the ingredients, what do you call it, of what they make the jacket from? Wool, and they say wool, and then they say 10% linen. Sometimes they don't say anything, just they, they tie, they, they make knots, they, when, they, when they saw the buttons, they used linen stripes. Why? Because linen is very strong. Also in a color. All, all the fancy, schmancy, schmancy Italian jackets, almost all of them have is in a color. They put a special net inside, and they sew it with linen that it won't be wrinkled. Therefore, if you bought Hugo Boss, for instance, for sure has. Armani, 50% chance. Many of Ridelli, very high chance. All this fancy Italian suit, they have shatnez. What do you have to do? You have to check. If you first bought it, and now you check, and they found it, you pay 50 bucks, they replace the color. It makes it kosher. Or they replace the buttons. They, they can keep the same button. They just replace this, this, the sewing of how it's sewing. That's called shatnez. Uh, I don't care. Or he shave his peot. Shave with, even with the, with the machine. He doesn't keep peot below the bone here. He has to have peot below the bone and below the bone here. Right? He said, ah, not for me. Oh, he cut like this. Straight line, like the Italian barbers do with a razor. <laughs> he cuts away all your peot. Jews are not allowed to cut the peot. So somebody like this is doing it bishita, areu mumar. Mumar. Then, or he said, what am I going to be with the Jews? Let me pretend I'm a goy. I live to Texas. I moved to Texas, Las Vegas. I changed my name. 
He used to be Steinberg, I'm going to change it to Stanton. He used to be Cohen, I'm going to change it to Katz. It sounds German. You know, whatever, I'm going to make myself a Goy name. And nobody know who I am. I won't tell my children that they're Jewish. That's, these are the kind of people that they're talking about. Now, who are the ones who make the public commit sins? Machtie Arabim. I already said that before. But this is, they give an example. Like Yerovam ben Navat put a big statue and brought the people to bow down to that statue. Uh, Tzadok and Baitus, people that had all kinds of corrupted philosophy. Today we have millions like this, but in that time there were only two. So they, they, they memorized in history as two corrupted philosophers that contradict the philosophy of God. So that's why they called Tzdukim and Baitusim, because they were two wicked people, Tzadok and Baitus, two very big wicked people. Then, like for instance Darwin, somebody that comes and says a person came from the monkey, it's a very big infidence, it's Kofer Batora. So what we see from here, the Darwinists, how, why they call them Darwinists? Because they follow this wicked person. You understand? Mm -hmm. So that's what it is. Or someone who forced people to eat not kosher. Force them to be Mechalel Shabbat, his wife, his children. Get in a car. Get in a car or I'll throw you out of the house. Or you'll never see a penny from me. He put pressure on them to be re wicked. That's called Machti Arabim. I don't allow you to go to yeshiva. Don't go to the rabbi's lecture. Don't, I don't want you to go. Then is a call, it's called Machti Arabim. Or forcing or convincing Jews to believe in that idol or to believe in that rabbi. For instance, if a person stands and says, Rabotai, I want to tell you, I know you're keeping Shabbat, you're keeping mitzvot, but if you don't believe in Rabbi Nachman Mibreslev, that is the most important person in the world, and without him you cannot connect to Hashem, you have nothing in your life. This is what we're talking here about. Not only if he say believe in Yoshke, in J.C. Penny. No. Even if he say the holiest rabbi, believe that Moshe is the son of God. Believe that the Rambam, without him you have no connection to God. Believe Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, you see, or the Zohar is very special. You have to connect to God through him. Anything like this is a very, very, very big sin. Very, and people don't understand how severe is this sin. They have no understanding how Hashem is angry that you give power to somebody else besides him. Then, someone who does not want to participate with the Jewish community. Everyone is fasting and crying because there's a tragedy in town. He doesn't come. People build Bet HaMikdash. He doesn't want to come. People build Yeshiva in his place. Everybody gives money. They come to him. I don't want. They make a hospital. I don't want. They open always everything. Leave me alone. I'm not interested. Everyone pray Yom Kippur in a shul. He doesn't come. Everyone fasting. He goes, I don't know, he's on a beach. He never participate with the Jewish community. Somebody like this called Poresh Midarkei Tzibur is out of the public uh, behaving, is isolating himself. Somebody like this, Hashem Yerachem, people are crying for the destruction of Bet HaMikdash in Tisha B'Av. He goes to his business. doesn't bother him. We're not talking someone that they're going to fire him if not. That's a different story. Now you have to ask a question. He, can, he cannot go to his store. The guy is there. I'll go at 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock, after we finish all the crying. 3 or 3 in the afternoon, I'll go. I'm fasting. At night, I'll make seuda, fine. But right away from the morning, he doesn't care. Everyone crying in the shul. And he goes to Manhattan with his cigar selling diamonds in 47th Street. What happened? Yom Kippur today. Yom uh, Tisha B'Av today. Leave me alone. It's too much. Streak, fanatic. What do we care? The, the temple is 2,000 two years old. It's destroyed. I don't want to cry now. It's too much. Things like this. Or, as I said before, people who turn Jews into the going authority, to the king, to the mafia, to the mafia. He called the mafia. Are you looking for that guy? Here, I tell you where he is. He's right now in the mikveh. Go get him. And they come, they take him and they kill him. There's, there's a person who called Moser. Somebody like this cannot be a part of the minyan. You cannot accept his children to the, to the yeshiva. You cannot let him enter the shul. You cannot marry any one of his family members. 
Anything he does, you cannot accept from him. He's not allowed to buy in his store. You have to treat him like he's Adolf Hitler. Why? Because he turned a Jew. A call. They don't take him. Yeah, the reason they take actions against him is that the people will be afraid to make that sin. And the only time sometimes people are afraid if they know that once they do it, they not only could destroying themselves, their wife and their children will pay the price. Many of the things you do to your children, you either help them or you destroy them. Mm-hmm. Don't ask me now what about the children. Everything you do affects the children. Whatever food you put on the table affects your children. Which yeshiva you send them affects the children. The way you dress on the street affects your children's shiduchim. Right? The way you dress on the street, 90% of the yeshivot won't accept politics, business, lies, corruptions, right here in the worst category of the sins in the Torah, with the beautiful beard. But it won't help him, the beard. You understand? Someone who called names to his friend to laugh at him. Yo-yo, fool, tembel, this, cross-eye, all kinds of bad names. You know, fatso. There's a lot of American bad names. If he doesn't care and he laughs, <laughs> he's laughing with everyone. Some people like to be a part of the joke. Then it's not as bad. But if he, if he takes it to his heart, there's a very big sin. Someone like this, I don't have time to finish. In, in another lecture of mine, I say the 24 things that prevent making repentance. Remember in one of the lectures? Yeah. This is now this next provision. I'm skipping it. If you want, you go into my lecture. That when it's called the 24 things who prevent making tshuva. Among them is disrespecting the rabbi, uh, you know, making bad names to them, etc., etc. You know, everyone who I mention here, and I finish with this last minute. Please pay attention. Everything I said is only if you died without making tshuva, without repenting. But even if you did everything I mentioned, everything, millions of times, and one day you stop, you regret, you ashamed, you ask God to forgive you every day, and you change your evil way, then right away you are taken out of the worst category of the Torah into a much better category. Doesn't mean you're not going to have suffering. Doesn't mean you're not going to have to pay money back. Doesn't mean you're not going to have to put a lot of efforts. Maybe you even have to come back in the reincarnation in a much better neighborhood, to a much better family. Your parents will be much holier people than your parents right now. This is as a result of your tshuva, because sometimes in one life it's impossible to fix. Uh, you know, if, if you Adolf Hitler and you make tshuva a week before you die, it's impossible to fix what you did. But at least it will give you a chance to come again and again until you have a chance to correct. However, if you die without tshuva, you have no share to the world to come. It's an eternal, chas shalom, eternal death. Mi amar lecha sheparu asa tshuva? Lo raiti sheparu asa tshuva. ראיתי שהשם השאיר את פרעה בכוונה שיראה את העם שלו טובים, שיסבול עוד יותר. אז אם הוא עשה תשובה, אז למה עשו לו את זה? Then, then, as I say, this is the last thing, nothing can stand against the תשובה, the repentance. Nothing. The repentance is a magic thing that Hashem made that can overcome any bad things that we ever did. And if you made tshuva even the last days of your life, you get your share back to the world to come. Like I said, maybe you don't have any reward. Maybe you never kept Shabbat. 
Hashem doesn't have anything to pay you for. But at least you look at all your sins in a different way as before. And that gives you a chance to correct more and more and more. We accept every person. Every person. Even if a person made tshuva in hidden rooms, is embarrassed to put kippa on the street, to walk with the tzitzit outside of his jacket. On the street, he's still putting a baseball hat and wear a jeans. But he started to keep Shabbos. He's not mechalel. He's eating only kosher. He's looking around. Nobody looks at him. He makes a bracha and he eats. It's not a great tshuva. But he's already changing completely his status from very wicked to a positive person. We learned a lot this shiur. I did two shiurim in one time for the previous shiur that we had a problem with, if you realize. Supposed to be in two shiurim. I made it back tonight. So we cover for both of them. Next time we almost finish. We have another three shiurim and we finish that series. More than half we finished. We'll see you with Zrat Hashem next Wednesday. Monday I have here in Hebrew. Okay, don't forget Monday. Thank you very much. Yeah.